Recently, I've been figuring out why we don't build a lot of this sort of building in North America. Yes, literally this beautiful brick bastard from the early 1900s. We've talked regulations. We've talked exteriors. Now it's time to get up in those guts. On the inside, buildings are now made out of entirely different materials, which is largely a positive thing. The materials are cheaper than their 1900s counterparts, but not actually a trade-off. Things like foam insulation, building envelopes, and fiber optic wiring are literally products of the space age. A modern reconstruction of this building would effortlessly be more soundproof and energy efficient. These are benefits that make living in a city more comfortable for you and environmentally friendly for all of us. But I'm down here at the cardboard monger because some of those differences are a negative. Because when fast fashion meets furniture, that's not good for anyone outside of Sweden. After 100 years, our historic building no longer has any of its original interior. Unless interiors are exceptionally high-end and artisanal, they're unlikely to last a century. This working-class housing wasn't the Governor General's mansion. Somewhere between the property flippers and the slumlords, the interiors got painted and pitched instead of being repaired and restored. But they were often replaced with short-term shit. So why are modern interiors so often short-term? There's three key things to a long-term interior that you often don't find these days. And I made a helpful acronym called HRU. H is for hardiness. A lot of this stuff is just straight up not strong in the first place. Here is a piece of standard laminated fiberboard. It's a composite material, basically glued together sawdust inside a protective plastic outer barrier. The problem is it only works as long as the barrier stays intact. Moisture wrecks this stuff like a cardboard box in the rain, and we just love to install this stuff in kitchens. It's kind of like filling your Zeppelin with hydrogen. Oh, the urbanity! Now, stone, stainless steel, or marble are pretty much invincible, but even natural wood, like this, is much better because of point two. Repairability. When I ding this table and pour water on it, sure, some of it's gonna get in, despite it being oiled and stuff. And if it was sitting under a kitchen sink, it would slowly start to rot. However, unlike this laminated particle board, it can easily be repaired. Cutting out a bad section and replacing it is a common job in building maintenance. Also, wood literally grows on trees. You'll be able to buy something that matches in 100 years. There's even an industry that pulls wood from the bottom of lakes and reclaims it for old buildings when it's exceptionally rare. It's also very easy to patch sand and paint wood. If I wanted to restore this, a scratched or damaged surface is easily fixed and refinished. And you can also do this. This is the final short-termism problem with modern interiors. They're very, very hard to update. So much of what changes with fashion is color. Right now, interior fashion seems to be Stormtrooper modern. Are you a Sith Lord? Would you like your kitchen to look like a Star Destroyer? Cool! Like all strong and practical styles, it's going to date badly. Probably with a reaction into something more colorful and organic. But what a nightmare that so many cabinets, counters, and cupboards will be plastic coated in this difficult to paint material. I could paint this desk white right now and give my room all the charm of a mental institution. Would you like to live like Sarah Connor? I should, okay, that's enough of that. Then over the weekend in 10 years time, I can sand it down and paint it brown or whatever's cool at that point in time. Because when it comes to color, wood is just made to be changed. Flooring illustrates this issue well. Many years ago, all the fake wood panel flooring in my first house was doing what it so often does, slipping around like a slide puzzle. A leak behind the washing machine was making it bubble. The simple weight of a couch caused it to peel up. Because I have a hard on for hard wood, I went to the store to price out a real wood floor. For some reason, the salesperson decided to push a thing called laminate flooring, telling me that it was what everyone installed these days. It sounded suspect, but you know, I wanted to be open-minded and consider what this person was offering. So, you know, he went out back and when he returned, he was <laughs> holding the exact same thing that I was in there to replace. No man, I don't want to walk around on stickers that have pictures of fucking wood on them for 50% off. I already know that in practical use, it only lasts a few years before looking like crap. 
Also, annoyingly, it had a slightly different groove so that I couldn't use it to repair the broken ones, even though it looked like it had the same sticker. He then went away and tried to sell me on engineered hardwood. This is a thin slice of hardwood glued to a piece of plywood. So instead of having something that is repairable, basically lasts forever and can be re-sanded and treated, I was again choosing a fraction of a lifespan and the price difference? I was saving 25%, whereas solid hardwood lasts for centuries. Of course I didn't buy it, because I want generations of Canadians to be lovingly polishing my wood. It seems to me like if you care about the environment, you should be letting your realtor know that you're not interested in interiors that are not hardy, repairable, and upgradable. Construction waste is estimated to be about 25% of what goes into landfills, which would surprise no one who has renovated a house or worked on a construction site. When solid wood gets pulled out, it can be downcycled into anything, even this. When this comes out, that's it, it's toxic trash. I talked to several people in the industry who only focus on repairs and renovation. The reality on the ground is a constant stream of work related to this material. The hinges pull out, it's unforgiving if installed incorrectly, and that happens all the time. Because let's face it, most people are only an environmentalist when it's reasonably convenient for them. I mean, I know lots of people who emit several times the yearly emissions of an Ethiopian when they go to a Vegas birthday weekend, but they sure do put their cans in the recycling. So it's actually the economic inefficiencies that get me, because when you're watching the laminate flooring bubbling and the cabinet doors pulling off their hinges, you'll be wishing that someone spent just a little bit more so that it would last. And some people do, because developers build for two groups of people, regular folks like us, and institutional investors. And those institutional investors, like the government or apartment building owners, do not want things that look nice for just a few years. When it comes to something like a kitchen cabinet, they'll pay twice as much for something that lasts five times longer and which their maintenance crews can repair and paint on site. When they do use fiberboard, it's not gonna be on a cabinet door or around the kitchen sink. They use another material and it's not even solid wood. It's another composite material called plywood. Or if they're gonna put in a cheap floor, they use this, which has no fiberboard in it. It's waterproof. It still feels like you're standing on a plastic crate, but you know, at least it will last. This long-termism is actually one of the best arguments I've found for purpose-built rental. So why do individuals specifically have this short-termism issue? Especially when, after going to Ikea, the cardboard on offer is not actually that cheap. Well, in the developed world with fast fashion, the average person wears a garment less than 100 times. You start to get a pretty good idea of how long things last after a decade or two of buying clothes. What shops you need to go to if you want something that's gonna last, what materials feel like they're gonna tear. Basically, everyone gets pretty good at figuring out what the lifespan of a garment is gonna be. But these low quality interiors, they last long enough that we only buy a few in our lifetimes. We don't know construction materials very well, and we don't live long enough to catch on. Oh, doors from this can only be closed 6,000 times, and then the hinge falls out, and you can't repair it, so I guess I should buy a solid wood door next time. There's also the, well, it won't be my problem issue. When I was a kid, I worked on construction sites. I had the back of a 60-year-old coal miner to prove it. You would often see workers making mistakes and then covering it up. So if you knew that the house was gonna be yours for the rest of your life, maybe you would treat it a little differently. But with flipper culture, many people won't be in their current home very long. People are thinking, whatever, good enough, but people in 10 years can deal with the fact that the fiber board is in a wet, high traffic environment. Won't be me, just needs to look good for the pictures. However, it creates an endless chain of people replacing the mistakes of the people before them, never just doing it right. In a country with a shortage of construction workers, many of them are bound up in this pointless cycle of endless flip fixes until someone goes and makes a nice custom interior. But even that might not last because the companies in this area have done a very good job of gradually accelerating interior fashion from once in a century to once in a generation to once in a decade. We're all trying to keep up with the cardboard dashians. Something that is most easily achieved by shopping by catalog. Beautiful interiors get torn out by fashion lemmings all the time. Mahogany interior, <laughs> too dark. So grandma. Mother has learned to keep plenty of refreshments on hand. These stores have created a physical catalog where people outsource having their own individual taste. 
You can safely assume when you buy things in their little showrooms that they all fit together. No one's gonna laugh at you. It's a beige backdrop, perfect for property flippers, an acceptable interior that your buyer can see their complimentary couch from the same store fitting into like a glove. So what's the fix for this? I often tackle these sorts of topics and there are some common solutions to these sorts of problems. The first would be legislative. Because of the notoriously short lifespan of these devices, there's a lot of discussion around phones and technology at the moment. It's not in the interest of Apple to allow us to easily extend the life of an iPhone device with something like a screen replacement. So legislation called Right to Repair is being passed around the world. It requires manufacturers to provide replacement parts and follow interoperability standards. So we could pass Right to Repair, but for furniture and interiors. You should be able to replace a battery in a $1,000 phone, and you should be able to replace a board in a $5,000 floor. These sorts of schemes can create systems that punish smaller manufacturers who find it harder to comply. So you'd probably only apply it where firms exceed a certain revenue. I also think it might be worth looking into a warranty system, but I really think this comes down to the materials. Because IKEA has options that do last, they're just not popular enough. In most countries, alcohol is taxed because making it more expensive decreases the amount that we use it. That tax is also used to pay for the negative externalities. Pretty much exactly what we want to do with disposable, unrepairable, and unupgradable furniture. It's convenient because there's one ingredient inside this beverage that is essentially the problem, allowing you to pay very little tax on this perfectly fine healthy beverage, and a lot of tax on this unhealthy one. I think that there is an incredibly convenient correlation on this one. This thing's made of paper. This, made, this is made of paper, this made of paper. Look, the tents are made of paper. Quite simply, materials that have a bad track record in certain applications should be disincentivized with tax or disallowed in a building code. The covers, the covers are made of paper. The whole kitchen's I'm made of paper. Ashton, pop outside. Why, why, why are you going? Come back. The builders of purpose-built rental often do use laminated fiberboard, but they use it in a hybrid system. So in a kitchen, the boxes above the sink are fiberboard, but the cupboard fronts where the hinges attach around the sink and the bathroom, you'll find plywood, a composite material that has proven itself. We need to create a taxation framework or building code which looks at what goes into landfills and what is not lasting and discourages or bans their use. That doesn't mean in all places, there are plenty of places where fiberboard has proven itself to last, where it's not high traffic, where it's not wet. We kind of need a composite building for our composite materials and we need to make that standard practice. All of these changes will make your interiors appear more expensive up front, but they're not, because what really matters is their price over their lifetimes. They're all gonna be cheaper long-term if this is done right. And there's a benefit of making short-termism more expensive. When stuff is more expensive in the short term, you do it less often. Therefore encouraging people to get out a roller instead of a crowbar when they wanna change the appearance of their kitchen. The lifespan of interiors has shrunk massively in the last 100 years. That's not actually saving you money and it's terrible for the environment. I've always thought it was weird how much people liked this store. How would we react if this was an American corporation? This is a huge multinational that has made it big by popularizing the sale of disposable fast fashion furniture. It profits while not paying for the massive externalities of filling garbage dumps and emptying forests. A big box retailer that takes the negatives of industries like garments and technology and then scales them up to the size of a house. A blemish on all the fantastic work done in construction when it comes to things like energy efficiency over the last hundred years. And it's gotten away with this by wrapping itself in the good name and colors of a Nordic country. And I know this might be a kick in the meatballs for the loyal customers of this store, but all of it could still exist. It could still trick you into assembling your own flat pack furniture. They even have solid wood options in here that do have longevity. They're fantastically good at making furniture cheaply. We just need to nudge shoppers towards making a purchasing decision that is a little bit more long term and a little less frequent. That'll ultimately save us all money, free up construction labor, and let you live in your truly forever home because hopefully it'll be in a truly forever environment. So much of what, ooh, purple, purple hands, purple hands continuity era. 
allowing you to pay very little tax on this facing the wrong direction beverage. But I'm down here at the cardboard monger with my friend who is a father on holiday. Bloody kids! Come back here, you punk! It's made of paper! I can't believe we nearly bought this. Hey, it's made of paper.